Good evening and welcome to Bethel Christian Reformed Church. If you're visiting with us as I am this evening, a special welcome to you. I'm Pastor Mark Verbruggen from First Christian Reformed Church, and it's my privilege to lead your worship service after this, uh, or what we call our post-classes exchange. So it's nice to be with you. I invite you at this time to stand as we are called to worship from Colossians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let us pray. Lord God, bless us with a reverent sense of your spirit. May we worship you as we ought, and may you be glorified and praised through us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our opening song this evening is We Come, O Christ, to You. It's number 238 in the Psalter hymnal. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from Jesus Christ the Son, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. As God has greeted us, let us now take a moment to greet one another. Our hymn of praise this evening is entitled, As the Deer, verses 1, 2, and 3.
You may be seated. At this time, let us go to God in prayer and ask for his blessing upon the reading and teaching of his word. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for the gospel, the good news that it proclaims. As we listen again to it, Lord, we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds, that we might really hear your word and that we might respond with lives that are not only lived for your glory, but that are also living testimonies of the truths that you reveal. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. In Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14, we are picking up a text that comes in the middle of a section called the prayer and, or the thanksgiving and the prayer. My usual habit is to preach through one of the New Testament letters, usually following Easter Sunday, and I really do like to go through it uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, section by section, and so in a sense, this evening you're picking up a sermon that uh, comes in the middle of chapter 1. And so our text will be from chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, and following the reading, you will find it helpful to keep your Bibles open as we take a closer look at the word of the Lord that is given in this particular text. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the, with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. As many of you probably know, the letter to the Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul to a congregation in the first century. In the part that we have read just now this evening, the the pastor, Paul, the apostle, he's a very joyful person as he gives, expresses thanksgiving for these Christians who live in that small town called Colossae. Now, he himself had never actually visited them himself, but he had heard about their faith and their love and their hope from his fellow servant, whose name is Epaphras, and you can read about him just prior to our reading for this evening. In this little town, which found itself embedded within the large and powerful Roman Empire, the subversive word of the gospel is at work amongst these people who believe. They have faith not in their nation, not in the Roman Empire. They have faith not in their leaders, but they have a faith and a love and a hope that is centered in Jesus Christ. Because they believe that this Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Now, as Paul writes this letter to them, he wants to encourage them in their faith and love and hope. But as he's doing that, as we read this part of the letter, and as we read the letter as a whole, we have to understand that not only is Paul focusing on this small congregation within the town of Colossae, Paul has a big vision of the world. He has a big vision for what God is doing in the world, in the Roman Empire and beyond. By the power and inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, we also believe that Paul knew us. He knew that there would be people like us gathered in this place in this year in order to express our faith and our hope and our love in the same Jesus Christ who is risen from the dead. We too are called to be a community of faith that finds its identity not in the world or in the empires of the world, but from the gospel of Jesus Christ, which proclaims him the Lord and the ruler of the universe. So how should we interpret this letter? In fact, how should we interpret any letter that we find in the New Testament? 
Well, when reading New Testament letters, we should not, first of all, read them as doctrinal treatises. They are not, first of all, ethical and moral guidebooks, nor are they church order manuals. Even if these letters that we find in the New Testament speak to such matters in the church and the world, it is more important that we read New Testament letters first and foremost as commentaries on the gospel. And let me explain what that means. We need to understand that the letters of the New Testament are commentaries, explanations, uh, a, a further account of that gospel that we believe. That's the context, and that's the reason why they were written. The context is the gospel, and the gospel says that a dead man has walked out of the grave as the Lord of life, and his name is Jesus. It is the resurrection that gives sense and purpose to everything that we now read in our text for this evening. Therefore, take a look at verse 9. Our text begins in verse 9 with the words, for this reason. Well, for what reason? Paul goes on to say, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The reason the apostle is continually praying for this church is because of their faith and love and hope that is centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that they have heard the word of truth, it is the prayer of Paul that they and all of us, continue to grow in the knowledge of this truth, the knowledge that comes through the gospel. Now, to do that, we need to grow in our knowledge of God himself. Now, this ordinary text that on the surface may sound like something we have heard many times before because we often read from the New Testament. We have heard these letters before. And so this text may sound like something which we've heard a thousand times before, but if you think about it, if you understand its context, the gospel context, then this really is a subversive word that speaks about knowing God and knowing something about what this God has done in this world. So how will it look if we really listen to the apostle and hear these words from the context in which he now writes? Well, in this way, Growing in the knowledge of God, which we all see is, is so plain in the text, growing in the knowledge of God means knowing how God means more than knowing just how God wants us to behave in this world, even though that is part of it. God does want us to behave in a certain way. But growing in the knowledge of God means, first and foremost, growing in understanding God's cosmic purpose for our lives in this world. That is the big picture. That is the background of knowing God's plan, God's, God's plan for the world and for our lives in it. You see, in the background of this letter is God's cosmic plan for the establishment of his kingdom of grace in Jesus Christ. Paul, the apostle, was educated and deeply immersed in the Jewish faith. He knew the Old Testament scriptures, and when he was converted, he, be, he came to understand that God's continuing word of life, the word which was spoken in the beginning and called the universe into existence, that word is moving forward to completion in Jesus Christ. And so therefore, in verse 9, we are hearing Old Testament overtones in the words knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Underline those three words in your Bible, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And if you don't have your own Bible with you, just underline them in the Pew Bible. It doesn't really matter. These words are important, and they are full of Old Testament overtones. Let's first consider them in light of Proverbs 3, verse 19, which says, By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundation. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Now, a more well-known use of these three terms comes later in Proverbs 9, verse 10, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. As we read them in Colossians 1, verse 9, we need to understand their context in the whole Scripture 
because these three words were put together in the Old Testament as well. And they help us to understand that the Apostle Paul has a cosmic, a big picture in mind. He is speaking about the creation of the world. He's speaking about growing in the knowledge of God. These three words are linked then with creation and the new creation that has now come in Jesus Christ. Therefore, from the very beginning of this letter, as I said, there is a cosmic, there is a whole world focus to what Paul is saying. Now, the Colossians, and all of us here this evening, are being encouraged by the apostle to know this God, to know this God who reveals himself in the Bible more and more. You see, Christianity isn't just a generic faith. It's not just about, you know, knowing some benevolent deity. It's not about knowing some nice God. No, our faith is centered in the revelation of God that is given in Jesus Christ. And that revelation given to us in Jesus Christ has implications for all of life. And so the Bible reveals this sovereign Lord. And Paul is telling us to grow in wisdom by growing in the knowledge of this God and in the understanding of his revelation. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. So how is all this going to work out in your life where you are? How is this going to make any difference tomorrow morning, on Monday morning, when we go about the normal activities of our daily lives? Well, look at verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, and again, growing in the knowledge of God. We are told, know God in his fullest revelation so that you can live a life worthy of the Lord. Colossians 1 verse 10, live a life worthy of the Lord. Now literally what Paul is saying there in that verse is walk worthily of the Lord. Now that's a theme that we see throughout the New Testament, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to walk in step with the Lord, to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. That's the way of knowledge and wisdom and understanding to live a life worthy of the Lord and to walk in his ways. And so it's always good for us to examine ourselves on this day of rest and worship. As we pause at the beginning of a new week, before we go out in order to resume all of our normal activities, how is it that we are walking? How is our walk through life? Do you walk in the way of wisdom? Or do you walk in the way of foolishness? Does your life, what you love, and what you value, and what you strive for. Does it reflect the kingdom of God that is the new creation? Or does it reflect the empires of this world and what they love and what they value and what they strive towards? Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm that introduces the whole Psalter by saying, Blesses the man or woman or child who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. You know, day-to-day -day life matters because we are either walking in step with and towards the kingdom of God, or we're walking in the way of destruction. And so once again, we need to ask ourselves, what is the direction of our walk? How will we walk in this week that is coming? One way or another, we are walking in a certain direction. And as I said to you, what we love and what we value and what we strive towards will indicate very clearly which direction we are walking in. It's a good indication of what we are walking towards. And followers of the risen Lord are encouraged to be bearing fruit in every good work. Again, we need a very simple reminder here. When we read in Colossians 1 verse 10 about bearing fruit in every good work, we need to be reminded that we're not saved by good works, but good works, the direction we walk in, hopefully is leading to bearing good fruit in every good work. Good works are the lived out reality of faith. They grow out of our belief that a dead man has walked out of the grave and that a new creation has been born in him. You know that, but we must always be reminded of it because we have a natural tendency to believe that our good works are either irrelevant, that is, that is often characterized by those who are so full of doctr doctrinal truth that they have no grace in their lives, 
Or we believe that maybe our good works are a means by which we can earn our salvation, and that is often characterized by those who are so full of grace that they have no room for truth. But we need to be reminded that good works are the lived out reality of faith. New Testament theologian Kent Hughes writes, the Hebrews saw an absolute connection between knowledge and conduct. From their perspective, a person did not know something unless he or she did it. This is from where Paul and indeed all authentic Christianity springs. True spiritual knowledge means action. And so once again, good works are the lived out reality of faith. And in our text, it says that we are to be bearing fruit in every good work. That's our walk. That's the direction in which we are to go. And it's the gift that God has given in the beginning, and it is the gift that he has still given to us today. God gifts us so that we can walk in his ways. Therefore, we, before we begin to think that any of the good things that we do, any of the good works that we do, have anything to do with us and our own abilities, the apostle goes on to remind us of who is the source of our spiritual knowledge and action. In whose power can we walk in a new creation? Who's going to be the one who empowers us to walk in the light of a new creation? Well, verse 11 says that our bearing fruit in every good work and our growth in the knowledge of God is possible for those who are being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. It's Colossians 1, verse 11, and it's very similar to what we read in Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. Let me read that to you. Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20 says, That power is like the working of God's mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. In whose power will we walk? In whose power will we grow in knowledge and wisdom and in understanding? Well, real power is resurrection power. And it comes from the sovereign God who has created and is recreating this world. N.T. Wright in his commentary in this text says, God is regularly seen in the Old Testament as the powerful God, the sovereign creator who rescued Israel and Egypt. That power unleashed through the gospel is now continually at work in God's people to give them great endurance and patience. So then, once again, it is only in the power of God that we can have great endurance and patience as we walk in this world, growing in knowledge and in wisdom and in power. Because as we walk through this world, we are waiting for our full redemption in the kingdom of God that is ready to be revealed. Now, there is a difference between those two words that we find at the end of verse 11, those words endurance and patience. Endurance is the ability to bring faith and love and hope to a seemingly impossible situation. So you see that? Endurance is the ability to bring faith and love and hope to a seemingly impossible situation. In other words, when life is messed up, when you're not well, when the economy seems to cause us all kinds of anxiety, when terrorists can create a culture of fear, endurance is the ability, in spite of all those situations, to survive. It sees beyond the impossible situation to the new creation that has come in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Now, patience. Patience is the ability to bring faith and love and hope to a seemingly impossible people. When your spouse or your family seem hopeless, when your church life is not as it's supposed to be, when that roommate is as pleasant as a fingernail being scratched on a chalkboard, patience is the ability to see beyond all that to a person who is still a new creation, a person created to be an image bearer of God, redeemed and called by God's grace. Now, all of this is prayed for and given for kingdom living in this world right here, right now. And so our text, beginning in verse 9, moves on to build up to verses 13 and 14. And take a look where Paul says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness 
and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now these words not only bring the prayer for knowledge and wisdom and understanding to a fitting conclusion, they also form the basis for what the Apostle will continue to write about later in verses 15 through 23 of Colossians chapter 1. Now, if you still don't understand the fuller context of our text for today, then just look ahead to the conclusion of the entire section at the end of verse 23. Take a look at that. At the end of verse 23, Paul says, This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. People of God, this is the gospel. It's about knowing that our life is lived in the context that a dead man walked out of the grave as the Lord of life. And Jesus Christ is now the ruler over our lives and the entire universe. That's the point of the letter to the Colossians. And it's the point of every other New Testament letter. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and Lord. How now shall we live? That's the question we now ask. What is the status of this world in which we find ourselves? What is your calling and your attitude to be towards your family and your career and your friends and your education and so forth? Well, it's a calling that sees all of life from the perspective of the new creation, the kingdom of God that has been established in this world through the power of God who has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the cosmic and big picture in the background to this letter that we have read from. All of God's work is for the establishment of his kingdom of grace in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and Lord. And so as we read this letter, and if you read through the entire letter to the Colossians, you will see a very subversive word, a word that undercuts the powers of the day, because real power we learn in the letter to the Colossians and throughout the New Testament, real power, it's not found in the governments of this world. It's not found in the stock market. Real power is not in the accumulation, the acquisition of nice things. Power is not going to be found in your associations with certain people or institutions. Power is not found in certain political ideologies. And so as Paul writes this letter in the midst of the powerful Roman Empire to the people of Colossa, he is giving to them a subversive word that is rooted in Jesus Christ in whom the power of God has raised him up in order to establish the kingdom of grace. You know, these people who first received this letter, it would have been very tempting for them to think that their relative peace and security and prosperity, well, it all came from a man named Caesar the head of the Roman Empire. But Paul is telling them this is not true. And you know what? For us in America, it is very easy for us to make the same foolish leap of logic on the basis of our leaders and our economic and military strength. But that's not where the real power resides. You know this is not true. You know that power isn't to be found in the institutions and people of this world when you know the subversive word of truth that Paul is giving here in the letter to the Colossians. The wise person who knows and possesses deep understanding sees beyond the empires of this world to the kingdom of the Son of God because that's the point. That's the gospel. And within this gospel is knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And so the ordinary words of a New Testament letter that we, well, we might think we've heard a thousand times before, in reality, these are powerful words for, a wor for this world and for your life in this world. You see, in a world of injustice and suffering, in a world of hate and terror, in a world where things get messed up and we ourselves, we know we're messed up, we're not as we're supposed to be, we're messed up, the world is messed up. But when we listen to God's word and we really truly hear it, then we are challenged to recognize joy and thanksgiving through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The Apostle Paul speaks about this in our text. And he is saying that we will find it if we walk in the way of true knowledge. And so we know the direction in which we are to walk in this coming week. We are to walk in the direction of true knowledge. Now is the time to walk and to live in the light of the knowledge of God that is seen in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And now is the time for the church in America and around the world to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. At this time, let us sing our hymn of response, A Word of God Incarnate. It's number 279 in the Psalter hymnal. We'll stand for the singing of the three verses. this time, let us go to God in our evening prayer. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you, our Creator and our Redeemer, and we thank you for your grace given to us in Jesus Christ. We are glad for having your word given to us so that we might know you and serve you in this world. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us faith to believe and make us willing to serve you and your kingdom of grace. Lord, open our eyes to your wonders and help us to choose life and freedom by remaining in Christ, who is our guide throughout our lives. Lord, bless all who are here in this place and all whom we bring before you in prayer. Hear us and answer us in your grace. May your worldwide church grow in faith and in numbers, remove all powers and authorities which would persecute your people. Lord, on this day of rest and worship, may your gospel be proclaimed in fullness and truth. Lord, prosper the work of all our missionaries wherever they are serving. We pray, Lord, for a blessing upon all of our families and friends. We pray for those who are sick and those who are recovering. We pray, Lord, for those who have concerns in their lives, some of them known to us, some of them not. We lay them before you, Lord, and ask that you would surround them with your grace and peace. We pray for those who may be mourning for loved ones who have passed away either recently or even a long time ago. We thank you for the promise that in life and in death we belong to you through Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this world with peace and heal the nations of this world. Lord, give wisdom to our leaders. 
Lord, we pray for an end to war, an end to hunger and homelessness and injustice. In our own small ways, help us to walk in your way so that we will work for peace and reconciliation in your world. Lord, make us living letters of your gospel of grace. In the words that we speak and in the actions that we do, may we show that we belong to you. We pray for those who have wandered away from you. We ask, Lord, that you would draw them back. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive our foolishness and that you would forgive our selfish pursuits. And so as we stand at the beginning of a new week, may your Holy Spirit come upon us fresh. Receive our worship on this day as an offering of praise to you. May it shape us and mold us, and may it send us out to do your will. We thank you, Lord, for worship, and may we have glorified you. Hear us in Jesus' name and through the working of your Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, our evening offering will be received for the Building Expansion Fund. At this time, we will stand for the singing of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, verses 1, 2, 5, and 6.
Let us confess our faith in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together with all the church of all times and all places, we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. People of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. And all God's people say, Amen.